Okay, so hello everyone and let's start our webinar. And thank you for joining the Salesforce development and continuous delivery with Welcomesuit and WooCanvas webinar. My name is Vladimir, I am head of product at the Welcomesuit and I will show you just a part of this webinar. However, I have a great guest today and a great co-presenter, Jack Moxon from WooCanvas. Hello everyone. Hey, hey. And in the next 40, 50 minutes we will covering a bit details about what is the Welkin Suite, what is a blue canvas, and then we'll spend the most part of our time showing you the demonstration of how you can develop with the Welkin Suite ID and how you can achieve great and easy continuous delivery with blue canvas. And right at the end, we'll answer your questions. And in case if you have any questions, just feel free to ask them right now. And we'll get back to them a bit later at the end of the webinar. And then I'll start from what is the Welkin Suite. So just if you are not aware, if you haven't used us, if you haven't heard about us, we are a pretty cool ID for Salesforce development. We are available for both Windows and Mac. And the main idea of the ID is to provide a lot of like great tools or I'd say features and possibilities in the same environment, in the same application. So you don't need to switch to browser, you don't need to switch to other tools, you don't need to, I don't know, waste your time switching here and there. You just sit in one application and develop. Also, as maybe like for some time, we were focused only on the development task, which included Apex, Visual Force Lightning. From some time before, we have started to focus also on administrative and declarative development tasks. So now the whole team can use the same tools, the whole team can use the same language. And I believe it's a Salesforce world, like many people are combining both worlds. Even if you are writing the code, you still need to work with the subjects. And in case if you are doing some administrative tasks, if you are troubleshooting some issues, you sometimes need to read the code and understand why it behaves this or that way. And of course, like one of the main goals, I even skip to the second slide, like two things that are very like tightly coupled from our point of view, it's your performance and your comfort, how you work, how you work. Because like if you're a developer or administrator and you feel comfortable comfortable with the tool, if you feel comfortable with your ways how you do the tasks, you're working much more productive than in the way in the case when you're like not comfortable, you are fighting with the tools, you're fighting with the environment. This why increasing your performance, just like using automation, using some advanced false anxiety, as well as increasing comfort of your development, it's our main and most important goals that we are trying to achieve using all of the tools that we provide in the ID. It's just like general overview and I believe like it will be much more interesting when I'll show you example of how you can develop and what tools you have in the ID itself. But now I'll switch to Jack and he'll show you and explain a bit what is Blue Canvas so you'll be prepared for the demo. Okay, thanks Vladimir. Yes. I appreciate it. So. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about continuous delivery. Um, it's a very hot topic today in software development. Um, you know, continuous delivery, continuous integration, continuous deployment are all kind of synonyms that get used with various subtleties to their, um, their different meanings. But before we talk about software development, I thought I'd tell one of my favorite stories about continuous delivery, and it comes from outside of software. So in 1959, uh, there's a man, I think, named Henry Kremer. He's an eccentric billionaire from uh, England, and um, he was obsessed with flight. And so, um, as many eccentric billionaires do, he decided to create a prize for the first team that could build a human-powered flying machine. So this is a machine that could actually fly for a certain distance through an obstacle course um, just under human power. And so you can see a photo of the, the team that won it. That's the Gossamer Condor there in the photo. Um, but it was announced in 1959, so dozens of teams from universities all over the world uh, started to, to try this task. But it took until uh, Dr. Paul McCready started in 1977 to win. So teams had done it for almost uh, a decade or over a decade. And what they would typically do is um, come up with an elaborate design and uh, they would work on that for maybe six months and they would build it for maybe six months. And then they would uh, run a test and um, they would run the test and they would crash. So basically what they were doing is releasing once a year and then they would go ahead and, and try it and then it would crash. And then they would start over again, right? So uh, they were only able to get you know one, one attempt every year. So McCready came in and he said, the problem is, is not building a human flyer machine, it's building an airplane that I can build in half a day. And so what he did was he focused on building a, 
a craft that uh, they could run and, and test and crash and then iterate on it and try it again the same day. So, you know, he was able to work on it and in six months, he was able to run um, hundreds of tests, whereas others were able to run one test every year. And that's how he won. And so it's the same same concept here, and it's kind of a fun story. And it's useful, I think, um, especially in the Salesforce development ecosystem, talking to people who maybe aren't software developers on your team or managers who are interested in continuous delivery. Uh, and it kind of shows kind of the value of, of, uh, of investing in this. So um, there are, of course, some challenges to achieving continuous delivery with uh, Salesforce development. Um, I'm sure everyone here is is all too aware of them. The first is code clobbering. So um, this is, you know, if you don't have a good source control solution, uh, one developer admin may overwrite another person's code. You know, we've talked to teams that have lost uh, six months of work um, just from one developer pushing to a sandbox or refreshing a sandbox, and they weren't ready for it. Um, and we've also talked to teams who are using spreadsheets to kind of manage this, and it really slows down the process and can be quite painful. Um, of course, then, if you go ahead and want to do a, a deployment, it's hard to be continuous because it's so manual. You either have change sets, which you know can take some people eight hours to do a deployment, um, and it's very error prone because it's manual. And if you are running Ant scripts, um, those are a bit better, but they still um, are kind of slow and require maintenance and um, are difficult to get into a continuous iteration. And then, of course, without source control, you have no ability to roll back. So you're doing all these manual things, and if you want to roll back to a previous state, because a bug got in or whatever, you don't have the ability to do that. So that's a, a key challenge that I think everyone's probably familiar with. There are really two sources of these challenges, um, and the sources are a lack of source control. So um, you know, source control is key for allowing teams to collaborate safely and roll back. Um, and then, of course, change sets being manual is a challenge. So um, why do you need source control on Salesforce? Well, Blue Canvas is a source control tool, so let's talk at a higher level about why source control matters. Well, first and foremost, it prevents you from losing work. Um, it's automatic backup. Uh, so being able to, to kind of audit and, and roll back is, is crucial. It also allows you to collaborate better. So it prevents you from overriding the code of someone else. It's designed to handle uh, merging code from one branch into another. That's what source control can do. Um, many of our users today are, are using us because of SOX compliance. So um, you know, Salesforce gives you a little bit in the audit trail, but you don't have a very detailed look at what has changed over time and who has done the changes. And so if you want to be compliant, uh, either with a, a regulatory uh, body or with just software development best practices, you need the ability to audit changes. And of course, um, being able to revert to previous states is also a crucial uh, benefit of, of source control for Salesforce. Now, um, you know, there's many different types of source control. Um, uh, we particularly like to use Git. Uh, this says, I don't always use version control, but when I do, I use Git. Uh, there's SVN, there are other options, but Git has sort of emerged as the, the best tool for source control, and Blue Canvas is built on Git, and we'll, uh, we'll show you that in the demo. Now, um, on the next slide, we'll talk about continuous delivery. So uh, why do you want to do continuous deployment? So um, first and foremost, you want to remove manual issues from your deployments. So automation is key. That, that allows you to prevent errors. Um, automation also saves a lot of time and money, and I know a lot of Salesforce teams are constantly stretched for budget and wanting to make sure that they can deliver uh, great applications um, you know, quickly uh, and, and cost effectively. And so uh, when you do automated builds, it's, it's uh, much better than spending eight hours you know, manually doing a change set or um, debugging a, an ant script. Um, Another best practice is keeping your production orgs in sync with your development and sandboxes. And so this can be a bit of a challenge with the traditional refresh um, mechanism, but if you have a good continuous deployment, like I'll show you in Blue Canvas, um, you can make sure that your developer sandbox always closely mirrors production. And so whenever you're developing, you know that, that uh, anything you push to prod is gonna be well received and there won't be surprising bugs. And then most important, you know, as developers, we like to build code, we like to get our features out into the hands of users. It's kind of why we're passionate about this. And so whenever you release faster, you're able to deliver value to your end users faster. And that's a very satisfying feeling. And it also allows your business to be more competitive because um, the team is able to move faster and, and get ahead. So those are some of the reasons that uh, we look at source control and continuous deployment. And we'll go into that more in the, the demo. Uh, but I think Vladimir is gonna start. So I start from the very beginning and you can see right now the open idea. I have opened a project and I have opened a couple of panels. 
And one of the ways how we achieve the goal to increase your comfort and increase your performance is to provide you almost everything that you might need in your day-to-day -day tasks right here in the different panels. So right now for my like, usual tasks and also for demo purposes, because I'm demoing the flow that I'm doing almost every day, I have like test results panel, which shows me my previous test runs. I show debug works panel because I always love to read works. I have code coverage information. And there is a like whole bunch of other panels here, like PMD report, like writing bundle explorer. There is even admin panel, there is version control panel here. So lots of them, but like from for myself, the best way out, the best info, like amount of information is this. And it's just like completely to you on how you want to see information and what information you'd like to see because everything is configurable. You can switch layouts to a more like Java way. So you'll have your solution explorer on the left side. Now I'll get it back this way. Yeah. And I'll start from the solution explorer. It's the entry point to your project. And as in any other ID or tool for Salesforce, you see here your components like our bundles, like classes. But wait, what's this? We have a Great ability here, like in any I don't know, other development platform like Java, .NET, like web development, you have an option to create a custom folders and to organize your project structure in the way that it is most usable for you. So I have a special folder called demo where I have everything that I might need for my demo today. I have here a subject, I have here Visual Force page, Anonymous Apex, Apex, even CSS file from static resource. So I don't need to go through like here and there and the solution explorer into different folders. I have everything here. What it means for your regular development where you're doing your job, you can have Visual Force pages with their controllers, with unit tests, with data resources, all of this in the same place. You can have your Apex trigger handler with Apex trigger with a subject itself in one folder, for example. You can separate functionality by applications, by layers, of your architecture. So it's just up to you how you organize this. But anyway, like if you're working with mid-sized project, I believe you will have at least 100 classes. And having all of them in the same folder is huge pain from our point of view. Another small but cool thing is the static resources are always unzipped here. So you don't need to do anything for changing your CSS or JavaScript files. You just jump into, into them do your changes, you have great code completion for CSS, make your changes, press the five, and your changes will be applied to the organization immediately. So nothing to deal with zipping, unzipping files. It's not about the ID. In terms of what do we support here, we support everything that is related to Apex, to Visual Force, Lightning, static resources, of course. We support not everything about the metadata, but we support about 20, 25 different metadata types. We are thinking about increasing the support, but it's, who knows? So for most of the things, like we have pretty great code completion. So for CSS, it's absolutely great. For JavaScript, it's OK. It is getting better and better every release. For Apex, I believe I can say that we have one of the greatest code completions on the kind of market. So let me show you a bit about it. For our Apex, we have built our complete, like from scratch, the Parser, Rexor, Grammar, IntelliSense wrappers. So everything else is built from scratch. And the cool thing is that it works right from the right from the box and it works offline. So for example, if you declare a new variable of some like type of my customer subject, right here on the next line you will see this variable. So you don't need to push your changes to the organization. You have them right here immediately. Once I press dot, I have all of the standard and custom subject fields, as well as I have all of the methods inherited from the standard as subject. So it's pretty cool and it provides you everything that you might access from your Apex. We support everything provided by uh, standard Salesforce namespaces, classes, for example, if I go to Apex pages, what else we have here? And yeah, you can see you can even see on the screen. So we have built in some some parts of the documentation from Apex reference. So you don't need to go to the website to get this information. You see the details right here in the code completion. So we know everything about uh, everything provided by Salesforce. We also recognize your standard, like your custom classes, as well as we recognize everything that is related to a subjects, both standard as objects, custom as objects, with all of your customizations. 
So you can very easily access all of them right from here from the code completion. Another cool thing is that we provide support for APS doc. I've showed here. So for example, if you have a method with a couple of parameters with return type and you want to provide documentation for it, you can very easily right click in the method itself and select generate APS doc for current context. It will generate for you a kind of header template which will have all the parameters passed here and you just need to enter the description for all of them. Once I do this, and the next time I will try to call this method from the Apex code. In code completion, I will see how it's called in my static. Yep. Right here in the code completion, I will see the descriptions that was taken from the Apex code. This means that I don't need to waste my time and money to document the code anywhere else. I can do this right here in the ID. Once I start entering parameters, you also see parameter descriptions taken from the documentation. So like here, from now on, you can self-document your code and don't need to go to kind of corporate wiki or Google Docs or spreadsheets or anywhere else to find the documentation for your code. And if I'll stop doing this stuff and we'll show you a bit more interesting flows, I'll get back to the test results panel. So in the test results, you can see my previous test runs. You see that in the last two days, I've done about 10 different runs. Some of them were successful, some of them have failed. And for the test runs, which were failed, for the test methods, which, were, which have failed, once I uh, select them, in the lower part of the test results panel, I see basic details from Salesforce. I can even open a log file right from here in one click. And you see our pretty cool viewer for debug logs. It consists of two parts. On the upper part, there is a hierarchy tree-like view of your execution. So it's very handy for complex environments with lots of triggers, with lots of handlers, with lots of nesting. And it's very handy sometimes to find interesting code right here. Click on the line in the hierarchy view and you will get it selected in the text-like view. Otherwise, if you prefer to work with the regular text view, we allow you to do this. We have some basic highlighting for different types of events, and even without spending any time, you can see in the code map on the right that somewhere near the bottom we have an exception because it's red. Once you find an exception, there is a one pretty great feature from myself. I'm always showing it on all the webinars and all the demos because I really love it. It saves me a lot of time, and it's like, I don't know, the best bang for the buck because it's just two clicks. And I'm right here in that line in the code which has thrown that exception or which have produced the certain line in the debug log file. This means that I don't need to uh, try to parse manually this log file to get the line number from the log. I don't need to understand in what class we were talking about. I just right click, select go to source, and here am I, we have an exception right here. After this, we have built a great option called the Apex Retrospective Debugger. It's our own debugger, which doesn't require you to spend money and like, pay money to Salesforce for a debug tool, because we are developers. We need to troubleshoot issues. We, we are doing bugs sometimes. So in case if I want to test this unit, like debug this unit test, I just right click on it and select debug unit test. At the same time, the ID will start a test run. You can see it in the real time right here in the test results panel. Once it finished, we'll download the log file, analyze it, and provide you kind of retrospective debugging experience. So it might have some limitations due to the Salesforce scripting files and two megabytes. However, in 80 plus percent of cases, it's absolutely enough to have the information that we provide to speed up your debugging 10 times, I'd say. So once we have started the debugging, you see the current execution, like current line which will be executed. We see the call stack, we see locals panel, which will show us our local variables. We see information about garner limits, so if you have issues with performance, and in Salesforce is a pretty common case, you can very easily go through your execution flow step by step, and you will get the information how your garner limits are being changed and how they are being used. So for example, if you go through step by step, you see that right now, this way, this way. So you see that we have variable i equals 5, you have some static field in dummy class, we even have object of type dummy class, and we see some of its parameters right here in the local. So you, again, don't need to read that 
how many? 500 lines of the debug log file to debug this unit test. You just go through step by step and you see how your logs are being limits are being changed, how your variables are changed, and how your debug logs are generated. Because you also see debug logs in the debug mode. In case if you're debugging the big part of your kind of logic, you can skip everything and go directly to the breakpoint, which I've set on the exception. So if I go here, I see that assertion expects to have seven and we have in real value six. So I can go a couple steps before. And as you can see, as we are switching to another class, it's a dummy class. We see this in call stack. We see the local panel showing us different values, taking into account the current context of visibility. And I can see that this method should return six because it has received six as a parameter. So I can get back. I can stop the debug process. I can make a very quick change to six. And after that, I will use again one very small feature, but it saves some time. So I select, I know, I will just use regular build. So I press F5. It's sending changes to Salesforce organization. It usually takes two to six seconds, depend on something. And once the build has succeeded, I can now rerun the test. I can do this from the test results panel, to rerun only failed, or I can do this directly from the editor. Because in the Apex editor, if we detect any test method, we are showing you mar in the margin results of the latest test run. So in my case, I just right click on this result and execute test method. You see that immediately we are showing you progress of the test execution. And I can even keep coding. I don't need to switch to browser like in Maven's Mate, for example. I don't need to refresh my page as in the setup menu. I see the results here and I keep going with my important tasks. Okay, I'll keep going. So, I oh know. So yeah, you can see now that result is passed and we have fixed our unit test, all is good. If you're talking about the unit testing, we have code coverage panel, which shows you all of your classes with triggers and shows you full information about the code coverage. So in case if you want, for example, to increase the quality of your unit testing, you can go through and see what logic wasn't covered. If you want to increase just plain numbers, you can filter out to show everything that is less than 75%, let's say, and also items which files which have more than, let's say, 20 lines of code uncovered. And after that, just wait a now. Why? Okay, but let's do it later. Yeah, I know why. And once I filtered out the results of code coverage, I can double click on any file, press show covering button, and I will see where exactly I need to increase my code coverage because I see covered and then covered lines highlighted with um, different colors. Another, just another 10 seconds to show you the debug logs panel. So it shows you all of your log files from the organization in real time. So as we are executing our tests, we see how they appear here. We can open any log file just with double click. We can set up debug log levels right from here. So again, no need to go to the organization. Just change Apex code to finest, visual force to none, press OK, and here you are. What else cool we have here? So I'll switch to Lightning because it's the main trend. It was huge hype about Lightning a year ago, and now it's just a must have to develop like using Lightning. So once you open any component or application, you will see our new editor for Lightning components. It's separated in two subtabs. So everything, all the items, sub items are shown as separate subtabs here. In the upper side, you see the preview of your Lightning component or application. In case of its component, you can select what application or what URL you can use for a preview. Because if you have a component and there is no application which hosts it, and you, for example, have included this component into the, let's say, account details page. You can just enter a custom URL of your account record and it will show it to you right here in the preview section. If I do any change in the writing component, for example, if I go to style and change style of one of the items to something a bit more usable, from yellow to let it be red, 
I press F5, and once the IDE will finish the deployment to organization, you immediately see the changes shown you right here in the previewer. So again, everything is the same tool, everything is the same place. Two other cool things I'll highlight, uh, maybe the first one, it's SOQL. So we are treating SOQL files, SOQL as separate files in the project. We allow you to create queries and store them as a part of the project. The cool thing here is that if you are missing that select asterisk from account, you don't need anymore to remember all the fields from account, for example. You just can right click, uh, click in the right side of the SOQL builder and select all fields from account in just two clicks. That's it, you have a big query in 65, 66 rows. You can select it and paste it to your apex. Or you can refine it a bit and select just needed fields. For example, account number, if it's active, and include some child items. For example, some details from cases and some details from contacts related to accounts. And you can even execute your secure query to check if you returns your expected values, if it returns your expected data. So once you're happy with it, you can export your secure results, you can save your query as a part of the project, or you can copy paste it to Apex code and use it in your business logic. Couple more things. So we have pretty recently introduced the admin panel. It's just like Work in progress thing is proof of concept, I'd say, but it's a dashboard for administrators and for declarative developers. Right here in the admin panel, you see all of your custom and standard objects in the organization. And for all of them, you can see lots of different information. So for objects, you see some basic parameters. You see the list of all fields. For each of the fields, you see as well some parameters and properties. You can right click here and open, for example, fields editor in a subject inspector, where you have a graphical UI where you can modify or create or delete fields from your subject. You can also switch to the field level security tab, which will allow you to save a huge amount of time if you need to change FLS. So it takes less than a minute to retrieve all, like, all the data from Salesforce. After that, on the left side, we show you all the fields of the object. On top of it, we show you all the profiles. After that, just with a couple of clicks, you can modify your settings. You can use quick actions for profiles, for fields. You can very easily clone your changes from your settings from one field to everything else, let's say. So, and using this tool, you can very easily modify your work fine-tune your FLS and then press apply and all the changes you'll get to Salesforce. In addition, in the admin panel, you see all of the layouts. So you see the details of what fields are shown in each layout, what fields are hidden there. You can see workflow rules and you can see that this one is shown in bold because it's active and this one is not so active. So once you click on it, you see the details of what actions are here, make it wider. You see what actions are here, we see the criteria, we see the description, and the same applies for validation rules. You also see all of the validations. So if you need a quick information of on like what exactly you have in the object, of what automation logic you have applied to this object, you can do this very easily via the admin panel. For the next future, we have a lot of plans about it. We are going to implement uh, workflows and validation rules editing with code completion with some graphical UI as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, I won't highlight anything else regarding the admin panel because like the main focus for us right now is SFDX support. We were planning to release the versions this week, even today. However, it's not always as good as, as we'd like to. So we will release a new version with SFDX support, I believe somewhere early next week. And you'll be able to play around with, with this cool feature in the welcome suite as well. So I guess this was a very quick overview of what we have in the Vulcan suit, and I can talk for at least 20 more minutes, but I believe that Jack won't be happy with this. So I'll pass the word to him and the screen to him as well. Thanks, Vladimir. Um, very cool. Uh, we, uh, we at Blue Canvas are very impressed with what you guys have built uh, at uh, the Vulcan suite. It's a very cool tool. So um, 
I'm going <clears> to <throat> do a really quick demo of <clears throat> setting up a continuous delivery flow with Blue Canvas that incorporates the Welcome Suite. They actually play really nicely together. So what we have here is a very simple um, uh, developer flow that you might see. Your, your flow might look different. We have one development org, one UAT org, which is kind of a staging environment, and then one production org. You might have, you know, depending on the size of your team, 10 development orgs and two staging and one prod or if you're a really small team, you might just go straight from your developer org to production. You can pretty much do whatever you want um, here. But each of these represents an org. As we talked about earlier, uh, Git is a dominant uh, source control tool that has a lot of benefits, and I'll go through those in, in more detail. But everything that we do here on Blue Canvas is, is based on Git under the hood. But that said, you don't need to become an expert in Git. So Git can be a little bit confusing sometimes, um, even for um, experts in Git. And so we try to abstract as much of that away if you don't want to deal with it. So to get started, what you would do is just connect one of these orgs. So uh, you can uh, very simply create a new branch. So for example, I'll connect a development org, we give it a name, and we tell if it's a sandbox, production, or developer edition. And then we go through the basic Salesforce OAuth flow, which you guys are probably familiar with. Um, I'm not going to do that here because I've already connected a few, but um, you can see that it takes about four clicks to get connected to Blue Canvas. And, and once you do that, we're listening for any changes that happen in the orgs automatically and committing those into a Git repo. So let's just log into this alpha to webinar org and make a very quick change. So I'm gonna start by going to one of the workflow rules. And um, I think we can say book flow here. And let's uh, just make a quick edit to it. And uh, let's say the book uh, name is now going to equal um, Don Quixote. Okay, and we can go ahead and save that. And you'll notice that you know this is a, a typical thing that you might do uh, in a developer workflow is log into the UI and make a change. You'll notice that I didn't have to go to the command line or actually interact with Git. Blue Canvas is gonna listen for this change and automatically pick it up. You can also use the welcome suite, right? So um, like Vladimir was showing us, yeah, you have your you know file tree here. I'm gonna log in and, and to this book price class and make a very, uh, quick comments. So um, let's say uh, we want to uh, increase discount. So this is a simple class and we're going to increase the discount from uh, 0.9 to 0.8. And then of course we have a test class that we want to open up and make sure that we, we change that as well. And we go ahead and save it. And then um, I'm going to go ahead and build this and um, this is going to push directly to that org. You can see the build was successful. And uh, again, um, we didn't have to go to the command line or do anything specific with Git um, or even necessarily uh, do anything to connect Blue Canvas in the welcome suite. Blue Canvas is able to pick this up automatically. So um, we can actually log into Blue Canvas and, and look on the, the web UI at everything that's involved in the um, in the org. So it's a very simple org. You can see these things. You can actually see that Alpha Webinar committed less than a mil uh, minute ago a change to the uh, book workflow. And so we can click on this and we can see uh, that our change has already shown up. So the value of Don Quixote um, is replacing this change in Alpha. And you can see that we actually grabbed the, the username from Blue Canvas. So, um, you know, we actually can see who, who made the change and we have a nice timestamp so we can see exactly when it was made. So this is very nice for, for the audit trail and so forth. So we can go ahead and, and check out our activity, um, and we can see that uh, this change was there. Uh, we can also see, you know, previous changes from different users. So um, you can see right here that this was made by Elena Ferrante. That's a different user on the on the org, and uh, you can see the the comment that she made earlier today. That's all available, which is quite nice. And we also have the ability to look into the files. And, uh, and see a history of how it's changing over time. So if I go into one of these classes, and let's say we wanna look at book price, for example, I can see uh, this is what the class looks like today, though if I go to get blame, we can see exactly who's changed what over time. So you can see that a few different people have edited this class. Um, the first um, uh, line of code is written by Alpha Webinar, that's a user. The second one was by Elena Ferrante. Other ones were done by Alpha Webinar, and they were done in different times. One was done an hour ago, one 22 minutes ago, and so forth. So you can really see all of these changes um, in real time. And this is nice for, 
for debugging. Blame is a harsh view. It's not one that we created. It's something that that Git does, but um, it's a it's a it's a useful tool for for collaboration and communicating. Right? You can even see you know which ones are newer or older. We can also see the specific history on that particular file. So all the changes that have happened over time. So um, we can see them going back to the beginning of time for when this was created, and we can select any of these and, and view what happened. You can see the one that we did a minute ago showed up, so we can see what, what we did. And again, you can see the, the change from 0.9 to 0.8 and, um, and the change to 80 here as well. So now we want to go ahead and um, do a deployment, right? So that's been committed into to Git, um, and we want to deploy our changes from the Alpha Webinar branch to our, our target, which is the UAT Bravo. So we just do this, and we can run a quick comparison. And we can actually go ahead and see side by side all the differences. And you can see it's just a simple git diff. So if you're familiar with git, it should be very familiar to you. But it's quite intuitive. So you can see on the left, this is what's in the target org today. This was there previously. And on the right, you can see the changes. And it's very easy to kind of know what's happening. So this is a, this is a great thing to see before you go ahead and do a deployment. You can see all the changes in a workflow. So um, to do a deployment, it's as simple as opening a pull request in Git. So we call it a deployment request. You can say new deployment request, and you can give it a name, uh, Alpha Webinar 2 Bravo for demo in a webinar, and we can say save. And um, much like you might see in other uh, Git-based tools, um, this is as simple as um, using Git to check and try to merge uh, the two branches. So the, the Bravo, uh, org is a branch in Git, and the Alpha org is also a branch in Git. And um, like you can see, they're continuously being synced. And so when we want to deploy between one and the other. What we want to do is just merge between the branches. So that's what's happening here. Um, the first thing we're able to do is check for any merge conflicts and um, ensure that it's a safe uh, time to merge. And so um, as you're aware from uh, our discussion earlier, code clobbering is an issue that uh, that we want to uh, make sure is not a problem. And so um, in code clobbering, uh, this happens when you don't have source control to check and make sure that there's um, an accurate uh, and safe place to merge. And so that's what's happening right now as we wait. Um, <clears throat> and you can see it's now preparing branches. And then we also are gonna run the Salesforce validation. So we're gonna make sure that everything is, is um, you know, compiles correctly and, and makes sense. Um, and there's no dependency issues um, we can actually show you an example while we wait for this to prepare of one that failed and you can see there's a, a nice log So this is one that that uh, that we did yesterday that that failed so you can see um, Rather than just deploying something that's going to cause a bug or a dependency issue We show you this log and so you can go in and, and see uh, Specifically what happened and say okay, you can't delete a workflow object um, has to be done individually And so that's something that we now know what we can do um, we can go off and, and fix that manually, or we can go into this edit files, and we can actually decide which files we want to include in the deployment. So um, you may not want to include everything, and, and uh, you may say, we just want to modify this one layout, for example, or we just want to do this or that um, deletion of the, of the class. Um, you might be noticing that, uh, that we handle deletions. So yes, Blue Canvas does do destructive changes. You don't need to... Um, uh, uh, do those manual anymore blue canvas can handle those for you automatically which is quite nice so let's go check in on our uh, our webinar uh validation and you can see it validated and it's uh it's ready to deploy so if i go ahead and uh, click this quick deploy button it's going to go ahead and, and deploy that for us um automatically which is great um, while it's doing that deployment, um, we can go in and check out the history tab here. So um, again, we can see the history of any org at any given time. So we can see the history of a specific file. We can see the history of a specific org, and we can see a specific uh, history of the entire uh, workflow. So this is the alpha webinar branch, but I can select different branches and look at the history on, on all of them. And you can see uh, different uh, things, and I can click any of these and see uh, changes that have happened over time. And then of course there's the activity stream. So this is a nice place where you can get a kind of general overview of what's happening on your uh, orgs at different times. So we can see an hour ago, four hours ago, 21 hours ago. This is great for release managers and folks that want to take a look and, and see what's uh, changing over time and they can quickly get a snapshot of who's changed what. This is an example that we saw before. 
Okay, so our, our uh, change deployed, um, which is great. So we're happy to see that. Um, so let's let's actually do one more thing. Let's set up a, a merge conflict. So see what that looks like. So I'm actually going to log into the Alpha webinar here, and we're going to edit this book flow one more time. And let's say uh, Alpha set up merge conflict, and let's save it. And then let's log out and log into the Bravo branch. Okay, and let's log into that same class. So this is gonna be you know, two people editing the same workflow. And uh, I'll come over here and you can see it did change to Don Quixote as we expected, but now we're gonna change it this time to um, something like uh, Bravo change to set up merge conflict and save it. And so, yeah, and this can be done, of course, not just uh, through the UI like this, but through the welcome suite or any, um, any environment. And we can see that uh, it's gonna pick up the changes and, uh, and do that. And, and I'll, I'll pause for a second and talk a little bit about why we have this automatic backup tool. So um, a key part of any Salesforce developer workflow is, is having a source of truth. So you want to make sure at any given time you know exactly uh, what's, what's true in the org. And so um, a challenge with Salesforce and source control is sometimes the org uh, says something that your source control uh, doesn't say. And this causes a big conflict because which one is actually the source of truth? Um, Vladimir mentioned Salesforce DX, which is very popular right now. And we'll talk about um, how we're gonna integrate with that towards the end. But one of the things they talk a lot about is your org is no longer the source of, of truth, it's source control. Well, one, one thing that you have to keep in mind is um, because uh, in Salesforce you can log in and make changes directly on a production org, uh, sometimes your, your code will be out of sync with what's there on the org. And so Blue Canvas by mapping directly through Git automatically solves that issue. So everything that happens is um, is safe and automatic. So you can trust that uh, uh, that what, what you see in source control is relatively up to date with what's there on the org. So you can see the first uh, change came through. This is how we set up the merge conflict for alpha. And we just need to wait just a few more seconds for the change to come through uh, on Bravo. And so um, we can wait for that just uh, a moment. And while we do, there's one more thing I'd like to show. So there's kind of this issue down here of the, the blue canvas uh, command line instructions for Git. And so um, as we mentioned, everything we do here is, is Git based under the hood. I've been playing just with the UI. And so you can see you don't necessarily need to be an expert in Git to use it. You can just go have out your daily workflow with the welcome suite and with the Salesforce developer console and UI. Everything will automatically be committed into Git for you. Um, but let's say that you want to um, you know, maybe you're a power user of Git or you want to do more with it. Well, you can actually clone this down just like you would any other Git repo because Blue Canvas is a simple Git repo. You can add it as a remote to an existing directory. So um, if you have other Git remotes already set up, you can use Blue Canvas in that way. And one nice thing is because of this sort of seamless integration with Git, we play very nicely with GitHub, Bitbucket, or other Git services if you want to to be able to um, uh, commit into there. And a lot of the things that I've shown you today through the UI can also be done through the, uh, the command line. So you can fetch, you can diff, um, you can do all these things. And in the future, we're actually gonna allow you to even push. So you can commit and then push to a specific branch and that will automatically allow you to uh, deploy without having to use an end script. Okay, so the Bravo change synced um, as expected, so we can see that. So let's just run one more quick deployment. So the target, in this case, is going to be Bravo. From the alpha webinar, we compare um, and we see side by side, and uh, you can see that there's um, uh, just the change that we set up there. And we can say, let's create a new deployment request uh, for webinar. And save. And one thing you notice too that there, there wasn't just the change between the workflow, which we did. You also saw some differences between the orgs, um, which were uh, different email addresses that were in, in, in different orgs. You'll notice that when we go to do the deployment, Blue Canvas actually filters that up automatically, which is a nice feature for continuous delivery because um, those are uh, things that Blue Canvas does automatically. And through the, um, you know, I think we have over 100. 
12 million lines of, of Salesforce code uh, that we're managing today. And we've, so we've learned a lot of these exceptions and uh, we have uh, custom logic for handling those exceptions and making sure that you can deploy in a much more automated way. So you won't run into issues where uh, the sandboxes are actually identical. However, there was an issue simply because uh, there was a different email address um, in different orgs. And there's other places that that happens as well. And so we, uh, we do everything we can to, to fix that. Um, a little bit more about our stack too while we just wait for this to pick up. So um, everything is Git based. So Git obviously is written in C. So it's very fast and performance. And then we actually write in, in Go as well. So one of the, the nice features about Blue Canvas is though there are still some limitations with, with Salesforce itself in terms of syncing and, and queuing and, and things like that, um, the actual work that gets done by Blue Canvas is very much optimized for speed and, and, and goes fairly quickly. And so um, we have the ability to do that. So we'll just give this another um, a minute or so while this uh, runs through the uh, queue and then we'll start looking for the merge conflict. I'm gonna check on the uh, question panel, see if there's any questions while we wait for this because I know we're close to uh, running out of time. I don't see any yet, so if anyone has any questions, by all means, please uh, go ahead and, and start that. And we can see that it's preparing here. Um, and I think in just a minute, we should see our merge conflict detection. Uh, funny story, I was talking to someone the other day and, and they've uh, even talked about how they were able to uh, actually code clobbered their own changes. Uh, they were a, a one developer team and they were working to uh, try to like set up a, a more elaborate sort of sandbox structure where they had different changes happening on different uh, sandboxes and uh, keep different features uh, separate in that way. Uh, but they actually overwrote uh, some of their own work. Fortunately, it wasn't a big deal for them in that particular case, um, but you can see that it's it's something that definitely does happen. And you know, once you get to two, three, um, or even you have teams of you know thirty or forty developers, you can um, you can see a lot of issues. So we can actually see that this validated, so it's safe to uh, to deploy from a validation perspective. But there's a conflict, and so uh, Blue Canvas is highlighting this for us. And so rather than just going ahead and letting us deploy automatically. It says, uh, let's take a look at the conflict. So what we can see is um, there was a change in each org that happened. And so uh, as expected, one org changed and, and the same place in the other org changed. And so it asks us, hey, which one of these do you actually want to do? And we can just like very simply toggle between these um, and decide which we want to keep. So if we don't want to overwrite the target, we can say keep the original and that will keep the Bravo change. If we do want to, because that's, uh, that's the preferred thing. We can say keep changes. We mark it as resolved and then it will go ahead and, and run through the validation quickly again and uh, go from there. So um, that kind of concludes the demo. Um, you can see how simple it is to get started with uh, continuous deployment um, and source control and having those automated backups. It basically takes four clicks to get started with Blue Canvas um, and, uh, and from there you can go. And you can see that if you're a Welcome Suite user, it integrates very nicely. So anytime you build in Welcome Suite, Blue Canvas picks it up automatically, puts it into Git, and you have the ability to uh, uh, have that audit log and, and then of course move it up the chain in a continuous delivery workflow. Um, great, so that's uh, that's it. I think I can pass it back to you, Vladimir. Uh, great, great and very straightforward to be honest. I really like, like the way it's how like different team members can work with Git and with proper like, CD and without like any need to work with like CLI or without knowing like Git because like when we started to investigate the Salesforce DX, it's cool, it's great, but I don't know how I will force my admins team to start using CLI because shit, I don't like it. This is why we are building proper like graphical UI for it, but still it requires something from people to use it. Yeah, thanks. That's a great point. It, is, uh, it really is designed for admins and developers because any Salesforce team is going to have many stakeholders and uh, you don't necessarily need to be a, a hardcore coder, but then of course we expose those things uh, for you. You, uh, I, you did mention Salesforce DX and I did want to bring that up. So um, we are actually um, uh, excited to integrate with Salesforce DX. So we see these as a very complementary tools. And so um, when, when things like uh, scratch works come out, we'll allow you to quickly spin up a scratch org and have it connect to a, a branch in Git as like a feature branching tool. So that's something that's coming down the pipeline as DX becomes more mature. 
And um, you know, one of the big uh, uh, tenets of Salesforce DX is source-driven development. And so, uh, if you want to take advantage of Salesforce DX, you need to have source control set up. And uh, Blue Canvas, I think, is the simplest, fastest, and best way for admins and developers to work together with with source control. And so, if you want to take advantage of DX, uh, we think the Blue Canvas is a great a great way to uh, to do that. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Well, I know we're close to uh, out of time, Vladimir. I don't see any questions in my panel. Um, if anyone has any other questions, speak now or forever hold your peace. You can also get in touch with us at team at bluecanvas.io uh, if you want to set up a trial or ask any more questions directly to, uh, to the team here. Just give me a question. Let me check. Let me check. Can you see the questions now? Yeah, I see them now. So I see one, um, how do feature branches work when branching off the development branch? So it's a great question. So um, uh, the the way it's going to work with Salesforce DX is you have this concept of a scratch org where you can quickly spin up in a few seconds an org. Um, Blue Canvas will have a place, and this is kind of coming in development, where you'll be able to spin up that scratch org and, uh, and connect a, a branch to it. And then you can actually pull from the development org into that feature branch. So Let's say you want to set up a, a feature branch that looks exactly like uh, that development org. You can basically just click a button and automatically pull all the metadata from the development branch into the Scratch org. Uh, make your changes in the Scratch org, run your tests, make sure it looks good. Then you want to deploy it back to that development org or say back to um, a staging environment or heaven forbid straight to production. Uh, you can go ahead and, and do a pull request just like we did before. So um, it's, a, it's a very simple uh, kind of model and uh, I think it's going to work really nicely. Um, cool. Okay, okay. So yeah, I believe we are pretty close to our time. So in case if you have any questions, just like try out Blue Canvas, try out the working suit. If you have any questions, both me and Jack and like our teams will be happy to answer any of your questions, just like anywhere, email, Twitter, websites, anywhere you can find us, just reach out to me, ask for all of your questions. And thank you for, oh, we have one question, one more question for, I believe, for Jack. Let's see, do you support downstream CD when there are hot fixes down in production? Great question. So should have brought that up. So um, yes, you can, because it's a kind of a Git-based branching model, you can deploy in any direction. So you can go from prod downstream, you can go from, you know, a developer org upstream, you can go from one developer org to another, you can go from QA down, and so one of the best features um, is making sure that prod and development orgs are always in sync. So instead of doing a full refresh where you lose your data, you can only do one a month, what you can do with Blue Canvas is every day or before you start you're working on a feature, do a quick pull request from prod down. You can see the compare, and that way you won't lose any features that you're working on in the sandbox, but you can bring down other things. So that way, you know, we have, <clears throat> when people get started with Blue Canvas, sometimes they have like, 800 different files, right? There's 800 differences when they do that compare. And that's kind of a bad thing because you never really know what kind of dependencies are there. Um, and so when they start using Blue Canvas, they're able to get that down to like, you know, four or five any given day because every day they're constantly pushing down from um, production downwards. And, you know, um, we know it's not a best practice to log into production and make changes, but it does happen. And that's kind of one of the nice things about Salesforce, right, is uh, the flexibility and the ability to log into to prod and make changes. And so we, we don't encourage that. Um, but it is important to be able to, if you do that, merge the code back downstream. Cool. Um, cool. So I know we're up on time, but thanks for the questions. If you have other ones, email team at bluecanvas.io. And thanks so much, Vladimir. Uh, we love the welcome suite. It's unbelievably powerful, uh, and it was cool to get a demo of that. And um, we love uh, working with you guys, so we'll, we'll uh, keep doing that down the road. Thanks, Jake, from our side as well. And thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar and spending one hour with us. We hope that it was helpful and interesting for you. And see you next time. Have a good day, evening, night, morning, whatever you have. Bye, Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.